Welcome to Inspirational Leadership. My name is Kristen Harcourt and I'm your host. I'm an executive coach and professional speaker and I created this show because I'm passionate about humanizing the workplace and transforming leaders. And in this show, we talk about those ways that we all as leaders can transform by working on our self-leadership. And as we transform, we can help transform our workplaces and the people around us. And so I speak to guests, whether that's CEOs, HR leaders, and leadership experts who are progressive, who are inclusive, and they're out there doing this important work. And I'm really excited for today's guest. Um, not only does he have a wealth of knowledge, but he is super funny too, no pressure. Um, but he always has me laughing and I know he's going to have you laughing as well. So I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Steve Iacovelli. Steve is the owner and principal of Top Dog Learning Group. He is also a speaker, author, and catalyst at the Gay Leadership Dude. He helps folks be more consciously inclusive leaders. Welcome to the show, Steve. Thank you, Kristen. It's great to be here. Um, Steve, I am so excited for you to just start off right away. Talk to me a little bit about your journey, both personally and professionally, that got, to, got you to where you are now doing this important work in the world. Well, thank you. I, so it's it's been fun. I mean, I've been um, in the diversity, inclusion, uh, leadership, change management space my whole career. So that's been four whole years now. No, no I'm <laughs> kidding. Twenty five or so. Um, but I, it it started that um, I actually started my 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 training career, if you will, in software training. And so yeah, I thought, oh, this is pretty good. I kind of like helping people, guide them along. And then I just started to 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 fall into the soft skills. So I went and got some schooling on that. And um, and then actually fell uh, working at the, the Walt Disney Company. I worked at Disney Cruise Line as an internal leadership consultant. And that was really when I started to understand the concepts of leadership, change management, and, and especially inclusive leadership as well. And kind of maybe I went to a couple of other spots. I was uh, with IBM as a change consultant for, for a couple of years. I was a university professor for like a hot minute. That was not my jam. <laughs> um, but then I did get my doctorate in instructional technology and distance education. So it's like kind of the delivery way to get some of these topics out. And then of course my, my master's in uh, educational policy and leadership. So all these weird things kind of aligned and came together. And then um, in 2008, uh, which was a fantastic year to decide to start my own business because the economy was just so awesome. But uh, I did uh, start Top Dog Learning Group. We actually had it as a part-time gig. A colleague of mine and I actually at Disney, she came up to me one day and said, we should start a business. I'm like, well, we have jobs here at the cruise line. She's like, no, no, no. let's like start a hot side hustle. And so we went to our boss and we said, hey, Patty, we're going to do this. And she's like, fantastic. Don't use Disney stuff. Don't use Disney time. Good luck, my friend. So that was like 2002. And then, you know, we just did a side hustle and it was fun. And then I, in 2008, it's when I decided, well, let me see if I can make this my full-time gig and knock on wood, here I am. Wow. 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 And, you know, the first thing that jumps out at me with what you said, and, and I love so much of the stuff on your website speaks to this as well, when it comes to, to learning and um, how learning is happens. And we, we, we both know that learning doesn't happen overnight. While we seem <laughs> to live in this instant gratification world where we want to just snap our fingers and we're done, doesn't matter what it is, could be about diets or fitness, whatever it may look like, but yeah. also when it comes to leadership development. And so I, I love your approach to it because it's not uh, one and done. It is something mm -hmm. that you, and, and I even love the way that you talk about, you know, we're going to not only do the training with you, but we're going to help to measure it to make sure that the training is doing what it's supposed to do, but then yeah. also start off by making sure you're really clear about what are you even trying to do with this training? <laughs> it's like a goal thing. What's yeah, going on? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's like really, really being intentional and, and yeah. getting at the root. And I, I, what I noticed. So, so often in organizations is that they're doing too much of the surface and not really going underneath yeah. and getting at the root. And, and, you know, and, and what's frustrating for me is, especially because, you know, one of the areas I, I focus on and we focus on a top dog running group is inclusive leadership. So it's, it's the beautiful, um, you know, I often, often show my little slides here for those who are watching. Um, I like to think of the, the dog house, if you will, kind of sitting in, in three, the three different, but very, very complementary areas. We, you know, do focus on um, leadership and organizational development diversity and inclusion and belonging, and then change management and resiliency. And uh, they all really do work together. And, and I really kind of, it, it, my big aha moment was when I was at IBM and they're, they're you know, we're going to make you a change consultant. I'm like, um, but I'm a learning and development person. Like, no, you got this. And like, 
within a week, I'm like, oh my gosh, I totally understand why you put us here. And, and so, you know, if you're not, I mean, any learning intervention, any learning project is a change management project. You're trying to change human behavior. And for some of our clients, when we go in and they're like, yay, we're going to have a, like, I just had a message yesterday from a client. They're like, we, we have an, it, are you comfortable going on site or you are, or your team? I'm like, why? You know, we do virtual now. That's kind of our jam. And you know this because I've been doing virtual with you. And they're like, well, well, we had a, a problem at one of our sites with diversity and we need to do on-site training. I'm like, okay, so it's punitive and you're trying to put a band-aid on something that's like, like training done. Yay, we fixed it. We're now inclusive. I'm like, that's kind of not how this works. So it's a bit frustrating, but it's a process. Yes. Yeah. And I think let's start off by even talking about this because um, not only do I sometimes like when I'm speaking and I'm asking organizations, what are you doing around leadership development? And I will be mortified when I hear HR leaders not putting up their hands because they're saying we aren't doing anything for leadership development. And, and I get there's a spectrum and people are in different places yeah. on the spectrum, but I, I'm obviously a big proponent <laughs> that we need this to happen. Yes. <laughs> right. The sigh, you can relate. Um, but like, what do you think organizations, where do they get themselves in trouble in terms of even when they're going to start doing leadership development and they recognize there's a need mm -hmm. um, from your perspective, doing it well and not doing it well, what do you want to see them doing more of? How do they do it well? Yeah, great question. So doing it well is when any workplace, big or small, we, and we tend to work with larger Fortune 500s, but we, we do some nonprofits and stuff, but doing it well is defining the organizational mission, vision, values. And that seems like, oh, you're such a consultant speak, Steve, blah, blah, blah. No, I mean, like organizational values are the social contract for any employee or member of, of the workplace. So if you're telling me these are the five ways, making a number up, um, that I, I should conduct the work on a day-to-day -day basis, good, that's how we can hang our hat on something. And, and it's also a way to get people on board or, or off board if they're not on board with, with those types of value systems. And, and I, I, I see this a lot. Um, something about inclusivity is usually in those top five values, if not defined um, as a value, it's somewhere in the little definitions there. So um, I often say that smart organizations, they, they, they identify those, and they revisit them, of course, because some, some values shift over time. Of course they do, um, as does your vision and your mission for some point. And, um, but smart organizations, once they have those all learning, regardless of what it is, somehow supports those mission, vision, values. And, and so leadership training absolutely should be talking about, great, um, being inclusive is one of our values. So how, leader, can we help you be more consciously inclusive to create that sense of belonging for the people around you? And, and that's the smart way the organizations do it. The not so smart way that we see folks doing it or, or um, try to help people get away from is they just throw a flavor of the month of a leadership thing. Oh, I read this awesome book, says some senior executive. And so all of a sudden it's the, you know, um, uh, the, the good to great, you know, a, a Collins book or whatever that was a couple of years ago and, or, or a, a blue ocean strategy. Yeah, that was an awesome one. Let's do this or fish. Let's do, you know, like, oh my goodness gracious. So, you know, like that lack of cohesive planning and strategy versus the, ooh, I went to a conference and saw this person and they were amazing and that kind of stuff. You know, it's so important. I've seen this and I've, I've spoken to the leaders who have been on the other end of this, right? They're like, yeah, we know, like this is what's this month and oh yeah, yeah, he's liking this stuff now. So this is where we're going. And so, and it is a little bit demoralizing for the group because they do, it does feel a couple of things. One, that it's a checkbox exercise, but and also, like you said, there's not consistency. Like where are we going here, right? It's like yeah. you're being pulled in these different directions and it, as you were saying that, it reminds me of the um, the new shiny gold thing, right? We've seen this, right? With anything, it's the ATS system or it's this one. And, oh, wow, this one has all the bells and whistles and yeah. we need it. And then you start asking, well, wh what are you trying to do with this? Like, what's your goal? And they're not even pulling the data and using it in a way. And so I think it's such a great reminder for that leader because this show is also about the leader and their self-awareness yeah. for them to perhaps take a step back and ask themselves what's going on with them where they're constantly jumping on the next thing that shows up yep. as opposed to squirrel, squirrel. right? <laughs> right? Instead of the focus and, and really asking yourself what, what you're doing. Yeah. And so then when you start to think about 
working with the organizations and, and doing some of this leadership development. What do you notice? I'd love to hear some of the stories with the companies you've worked with, with some of those before and after. So you went with the company, these are where they were struggling and that beautiful transformation you started to see. Yeah. it's it, and, and we've, like I said, we, we've worked with some really fun folks over the years. And if you're looking, there's a, a, a screen of, of a bunch of the logos. Um, I remember one of our, our clients was a, um, a large restaurant conglomerate. So I can't really share their name. Um, but we were creating a, a diversity um, a leadership program for all of their restaurants throughout North America. It's like 6,000 or so target audience. The very first meeting I said to the client, so how are we gonna know if this works? Like, what's your what's your measurement strategy? What's the goal? Oh, we got that covered. So, you know, we do this all the time. Like, okay, like full disclosure, I, I need to know that you are doing this. If you're doing it, fantastic. If not, we absolutely can help you do that. No, we got this. Cool. We go down the process of, of designing, and it, it was mostly, it was a blended solution. So it was a lot of self-paced with, with some um, face-to-face, regional face-to-face kind of stuff. And we're, it's like eight months of development. We're at the week before launch and the client's like, hey, do you remember that conversation we had eight months ago when you asked us the measurement thing? I'm like, yeah. That you said you got it covered. Yeah, we really don't. So can you help us figure it out? I'm like, oh, this would have been really awesome eight months ago. So we did and we figured it out and we were able to kind of create a dashboard of, of you know, luckily we didn't launch. So we at least could get some baseline stuff. But, you know, when I, when we talk to clients, um, a lot of times that's, that is the focus. It, it's, I, you know, as you said earlier, I, I love the measurement strategy of, of learning and development and, and the change management piece, because you know where the success happens, or if it's not where you want it to, you can, you know, adjust the dials as needed. And so many organizations just don't do that. It's a tick box mentality. And, and that gets really frustrating for me because having been inside as a learning executive, I'm like, I, if I'm spending a quarter of a million dollars on a leadership program, which th- some of our clients, that's absolutely what they do because we're receiving that, yay. But you know, but you know, when they're doing that, I'm like, and I even literally asked one of our big clients this three weeks ago, and I still haven't had an answer. They've been at like a client for quite a while. And I said, you know, how are you, me- how do you know this is working? And they're like, um, well, we we have the number of people who've gone through. I'm like, okay, that's yay, butts and seats. That's awesome, Kirkpatrick one for those who are learning and development people in the, in the audience. But I'm like, I want to know like, How's it changing the human behavior? How's it hitting the bottom line of your business? Because you're investing this much money. Why wouldn't you want to know what your ROI is? And so I, I often don't see, especially in, in the HR slash learning development function, that kind of approach to the strategy uh, or the business of corporate learning and corporate leadership education. And I, I think that's a big opportunity for folks. I couldn't agree more. And so I know there's going to be an HR leader or there's a CEO, somebody's listening to this conversation <laughs> and they're, and they're, they're, they're enticed. They're thinking, you know what, you know what, what Steven's saying is right. I want to do more of this. Yeah. So where, where would you tell them to start? Right. Because some of them, from what I was hearing there, I, it, I'm actually curious as you were saying that, because even the ones where you were offering, and then they said, we've got this covered. I'm curious, mm-hmm. what do you think's getting in the way? of them saying I have it covered when they don't, like what's the fear um, is it, that it's not gonna show what they wanted to say? Like there's yep. there's a, there's an underlying fear I'm hearing. So I'm gonna Absolutely. actually start there. What's What do you think the underlying fear is? I think it's three things. Um, one, you hit it right on the head. It, I'm gonna see things I don't wanna see and it's gonna maybe make my own learning function in the business not look valuable. So there's that. Um, the second is, I don't know how to do this. Numbers are icky. You're talking about statistical analyses. Ugh. You know, that's not people's jam. Uh, and I think third is the, I, I, how would I phrase this as best I can? It kind of goes with the numbers, but I think it goes broader that it's it's the actual approach because when I talk measurement with with people they're like well that's not a direct correlation and I'm like fine you know it's, you know, your employee engagement survey that you're already doing and you have a line on there that talks about I feel a sense of belonging in the workplace you, you don't think our, our leadership training is somehow contributing to that factor moving or not absolutely smurfly it is child of the 80s of course I could say smurfly but, <laughs> but you know and 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 so what I, I try to help people understand I'm like there's direct and indirect data points that you can create 
to get a holistic approach. It, you know, if you're trying to go like, oh, this does that, you might not get there and, and you get into almost this analysis paralysis thing. Like just put a line in the sand and figure it out. If someone comes back to you and says, hey, your training didn't move that needle. Great. There's a dialogue conversation you can have with that individual, but do something at least. Um, and I think wrapped around all that too, real quick, is the, the conversation that, uh, you know, again, training, leadership development is, is not a, so when I worked at the cruise line, um, at Disney Cruise Line, uh, sometimes I go on board the, the ship to do like, yeah, I go on and do these leadership coaching things, but then we'd have like a flavor of the month, you know, a topic of the month. And I called them affectionately a ship dip. So I'd go out, I'd go on board the ship, I'd dump the crew in insert topic here and I'd run away. And, and so, you know, a lot of approaches in uh, the workplace for, especially for leadership development, people approach it as a ship dip. And, and it's not, it shouldn't be. You're not gonna change human behavior by going to the gym, for example, one time. Yay, I went to the gym and I'm fit now. That's not how it works. It's a holistic approach and leadership or any, any behavioral change in the workplace is the same. And I think when smart uh, L&D and HR people see that, that you know, getting your leaders to be better is training. Uh, it's also communication, it's measurement, it's it's performance support, and all of these different components to change the human behavior. That's when when you start to see the magic happen. Yes, yes. Thank you for clarifying because I know someone's hearing this, and then they're gonna that'll help them to recognize too what they're working with when they're trying to get the buy in and help understand what's really yeah. operating underneath the surface. And so then what are, what are some of the things that you love in terms of when you're starting to look at those measures? You just gave one example there too, but um, what are some of the things that you would like them to be looking at for the before and after for some of those measures if you had your yeah. way? If I had my way, it, oh, if I, if I weigh my magic wand. So, you know, I, I often, when, I'm, when we're talking measurement and, and looking at the return on investment of, of executive and, and corporate learning, my first place to go is what are you already measuring? Because I'd hate to go down the path of let's create all these survey monkeys or insert whatever here and, and add just extra layers of, of data collection to the mix. And so I start with what are you already measuring? You know, employee engagement surveys are pretty you know, ubiquitous for larger organizations. Um, looking at retention statistics, um, you know, thinking through, okay, uh, you don't want to measure every leader going through the program. Okay, I get that. Let's do a, a scenario significant sample size and look at people who went to the program versus those who didn't go and just see what happens maybe on their um, you know their annual employee uh, whatever you do in the workplace to measure people's performance because everyone calls them something different which yeah. is just lovely um, so you know like those are just places to start before you get into the you know pre-test post-test kind of analyses which those work fine you know to get to that knowledge change thing but ultimately in the corporate world we don't knowledge is nice but we want to get to behavior change and performance change and so you know do we have uh qualitative like researchers going out there and watching somebody do something you know and and seeing the performance maybe depends on the role and the function and all that good stuff um you know ultimately we want to get to ideally to that how did it change the business the bottom line and so for things like sales training, that's gold. That's easy. You know, you went through this training class. How did your output go? Woohoo, you're a better salesperson. But things like leadership, well, how about we get a, a cost for hiring or for retaining? And so, you know, work with the bean counters and our awesome accounting friends, get some sort of agreed upon hourly wage or, or whatever is the right number, and then say, okay, look. XYZ leader who went through this training program, they, they kept their people more than people who didn't go through. Well, you can get a cost benefit to that. And so you start thinking about it from a creative way. Um, you know, some of this is a little squishy. Of course it is. Will we ultimately get down to, well, this is exactly how much it costs for productivity? Probably not. Um, but find a way to create your own metrics, get the buy-in internally, and then use those as a way to compare apples to apples. And I think on the other side of that too is learning design, because let's talk about COVID. You know, one of the things that we do as, you know, I mean, my doctorate's in instructional technology and distance ed. This is kind of a weirdly nice time for <laughs> the field that I'm in. And, and so, um, you know, a lot of our clients came up to us, uh, or actually we went to them in like around July is when it was pretty clear that 
COVID wasn't going away or we weren't doing face-to-face training anytime soon. So I went to all of our clients and said, do you want us to convert your stuff to, to something virtual? No, 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 we're, we're good. We're good. I'm like, uh, okay, but you know, you'll be at the back of the queue just so you know. And so flash forward to um, kind of like early, late fall is when all three are like, the three biggest clients like, um, do you remember that offer you said? <laughs> so, but you know, but the great, great thing is, I could show them the cost of delivering that virtual experience versus the fly me or one of my team members, plop them in a room for two days for these training programs and fly away. And, and basically the delivery virtually is half. And, the, and I, they're like, but you miss out on things. I'm like, sure, you know, they're not gonna stand around the coffee cooler and you know, during a break and chat. No, you're not gonna have that unless you actually create it as part of the experience, but you can really still accomplish the exact same learning. Matter of fact, it's probably better. So what we did for those two day sessions, we broke them up into two hour chunks over the course of say a month. Mm -hmm. And so, and what's better is in true adult learning fashion, people get a little bite-sized nugget and then they, they go away and think about what we just talked about last week. And then you get them in the the next session. You just spend some time saying, what did you apply? How did it work? What did you think about? What popped in your head since our conversation? Like, wow, I could really chew on that topic. And then you move to the next topic and kind of rinse and repeat. And the feedback is, is great. And a lot of the clients were like, we may never have you on campus again. I'm like, that's totally cool. I can sit in my house in Orlando and be so okay with that. Well, because it reminds me, it's the same thing. There's some parallels to with the remote, with people working with the remote learning. Oh, I'm sorry, remote work, right? Well, yeah. you can't possibly do your your job from home because now let me be, um, let me preface this. There are certain roles, of course, like I can't say someone who's in a manufacturing plant. Yes, right. you can go at home and do your job. Yes. So I just want to have that right. as a caveat to anybody's listening. Yes, I get that. But there were many roles that they're like, no way, like it has to be. Yeah. And And now those people are working remotely. And and I love what you just said there because it's true. It's creating space to process. And then they're also um, perhaps bringing in diverse teams that previously Mm -hmm. couldn't because that would involve flying everybody together or they're global. And now globally, they can be innovating and creating and using those diverse views and creativity. And it opens up some possibilities that weren't happening before. And, and, and that's a perfect point, Chris. As a matter of fact, um, in your neighborhood, literally is one of my clients. And we did, we actually took our one day uh, inclusive leadership program that we do for them, chunked it up into the, the uh, four two hour chunks. And, um, and that was one of the biggest pieces of feedback that we heard. Well, one, instead of only being able to have like 15 people in a room, because usually their rooms are smaller, we could have 30 because the, the activities just totally played out fine. Yeah. And um, and then the other thing is, it, to your exact point, um, the folks in Mississauga, the folks in Detroit, the folks in Philadelphia, I mean, they're all getting together and they're different divisions of this, this large manufacturing company as well. And they're like, this was so cool. I would have never met so-and-so from Quebec or, you know, so-and-so from uh, Sacramento or whatever it was. And I'm like, yes. And so I think that's the coolest part about all this is still building those relationships distance that maybe we wouldn't have had the opportunity to do. Yeah. And then things get done more effectively because before those different people were involved in things and making those solutions or whatever's happening on those yeah. agendas, business outcomes are actually more effective because the relationships, because yep. we know ultimately it's the relationships yes. that are all underneath, right? I love it. Um, so the show is called Inspirational Leadership. And when I say inspirational leadership, it is about those behaviors. And for sure, everyone's heard me say that. For me, an inspirational leader is an inclusive leader. And so I'm curious from your perspective, when you start to think about um, those leaders who are, because I believe leadership is a responsibility mm-hmm. and it's an opportunity. And there are behaviors that show up around those leaders who are doing it really well. How would you describe an, an inspiring, inclusive leader? So I completely unplanned, shameless, awesome plug for my book, Pride Leadership, which came out about a year ago. But um, what I did was I, I was thinking about this, of course, and that's kind of what led to the book. But I was thinking about what are the top competencies that really help build a leader to be much more effective as well as much more inclusive. And so it came out with they are authentic. Um, you know, their authenticity is out there in the workplace. They know it. They have leadership courage, especially to have some of those more challenging conversations. They engage in empathy. Um, they can really understand the emotional side of us humans, both with themselves and those around them. Um, they effectively communicate and, and specifically listen more than they talk as 
well as understand the communication preferences of those around them versus their own kind of preferred way. They foster and build relationships. Which of course, all this leads to trust. And then they learn how to shape culture and really uh, not just shape culture in general, but shape inclusive cultures within their workplace. And so that's kind of the, the, the basis of, of my book, Pride Leadership, um, strategies for the LGBTQ plus leader to be the king or queen of their jungle. Side note, it's not just for queers. Our allies love it as well. Yes. <laughs> And the thing that is is so great with all of those different um, behaviors that you're describing, I'm such a big fan of emotional intelligence. You know, that's so, so much yep. of the work that I'm doing. And that's all the stuff that I'm working on with leaders that you've described yeah. there, right? It's those, um, it's not something that you are born with this and you have a set point and there's nothing you can do about it. These are all qualities that we can learn and grow and get better in those areas. Um, but have, there has to be a safe space yeah. where you get to learn and practice and experiment and fall down and but get back up again. <laughs> and then I love with, I'm sure with what you're doing, a lot of the training, if you've got, can have peers who are supporting you so that you don't yeah. feel alone when you're on that journey. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm. Uh, so what we did was as I wrote the book and then of course I wrote it like a class because that's how my little head works. And so, yeah, we do offer an eight week program and it goes through each one of these has you know two bottles at the beginning and the end. And it's, it's meant to be a cohort network, you know, partnership experience. And the way we have it now is it's open enrollment. So it's, it's all these leaders from different organizations and that's awesome. Um, so they're like creating this own little lions, uh, little pride, I guess you might say. Um, and they're really like doing such a cool job of supporting one another. Um, and, 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 you know, feeling a safe space, like you said, that they can screw up or ask questions like, oh, I had this meeting the day and I totally hosed it. What should I have done? And like, yes, that's the way people were, learn is, you know, they, they maybe fail and that's okay. And then we just dust them off and say, okay, so what did you learn from that failure? And cool, let's, let's not do that again and kind of move on, on to the next thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and so one of the things that you and I were talking about offline before we started is, you know, the fact that there's been a global pandemic for the, the one year anniversary. I think a lot of us at the beginning never thought there would be a one year anniversary. We thought this was a couple of months. <laughs> right. um, and and resiliency. I, I talk a lot about emotional resiliency and, and I do a lot of work around um, emotional intelligence and mindfulness because I think it's, you know, it's, it's a lot on people. And so especially in leaders and individuals, but sometimes there can be even more pressure on leaders because they're taking care of their team and not necessarily always taking care of themselves. Yeah. And so what are some of those things? Um, I think you even have a course that talks a little bit about this in more detail. Some of those top qualities in, in order to be able to build that resilience um, when yeah. we're dealing with things like a global pandemic. I, I love the concept of resiliency. Um, because it's so universal. And, and, and so at, when I was playing around with change at, at IBM is when I kind of started to understand and really dive deep into the concepts of resiliency and how we as humans um, in a variety of different ways, either um, survive, but sometimes thrive in times of change where some other folks are just like, you know, crashing and burning. And, and what is that? What does it do? And so um, I think some of it is just the nature of who you are, I, you know, like anything else. There's some who are gifted in being resilient and flexible and, and that rubber band you know, can go super far, but some of us aren't. And, and so there are ways though to amp up or beef up your own resiliency. Um, yeah, I do have, I, I used to do a workshop. Um, it's funny how it's evolved. It was like a two day immersive workshop. We really dove deep. And then a client came back and says, hey, can you make that one day? We're like, oh, okay, well we could squish down, cut some things, cool. And then they came back and said, hey, can you do it a half day? We're like, oh, you're gonna get the best. So then, so. But during the, the beginning of the pandemic, one of my top doggers, um, who, who she was doing a lot of the resiliency programs for us, um, she's like, wow, wouldn't it be really cool if we had like some sort of self-paced thing? Because people need that. I'm like, that's a really good idea. So I just kind of sat down one weekend, looked at the information, I'm like, how can I pare it down even further, at least just as a starting point? It's, it's a, like a little, it's my gateway drug to help people, if you will. Um, so I, I boiled it down to, okay, if I had to just Think of the top three things to help somebody be more resilient in times of change to not just survive but but thrive um you know and that's kind of what i, I created this this uh one uh self-paced program but you know the one and, and I, I i've read all these books on, on resiliency and there's some amazing authors out there um but if you look at uh, there's a lot of commonality which is great yeah, like yay there's there's actually human have some consistency that's cool but one of the things that really helps you be more resilient in times of change is that positive view of the world is is looking at the glass half full and and your listeners might be thinking oh my gosh here's this ex-disney dude 
dude saying like, oh boy, everything's great. No, that's not what I'm saying. It's um, it's really just like, even when you, it, we, you have kids, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 Do you, you might be familiar and those listening might be familiar as well. There's a, a book called Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. Yes. Remember that book? Yeah, yes. I remember it as a kid. I'm mean, a I kid. That... I don't think my kids have, have read it, but I remember. I have to get he, that. <laughs> and he's got to move to Australia because he was really upset. And so I always say in, in my workshops that when you have an Alexander and a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day, but you can sit there and say, you know what? This is a crappy day, but what were like the three things that at least went well today? that's resiliency. That's, that's people who are, are, yes, the glass is half full, even when that it's half full of soup, that's really ugly and gross. And, but you're just like, okay, it's half full. What, what went well? And, and you can actually retrain your head to start to look for those bright spots throughout your day, even when it was a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. So that's, I think one of the, one of the biggest ones from resiliency is just shifting to that more positive view can make a world of difference in how you react to changing times. Absolutely. It's been something I've tried to work on our, with our kids, uh, eight, eight year old and 11 year old since the beginning, which is a little bit around also the fixed mindset and the growth mindset, right? Which yep. is also yep. in that moment, it's not like it's always going to be like this in this moment is tough doesn't yeah. mean that it's going to be like this tomorrow. Um, and then the other thing is that that I'm a big believer in, um, a, you can call it appreciation or gratitude, but having that gratitude practice, because then you're also training yes. your brain that when you, um, so we'll do that first thing in the morning. So already, even if it's a bad day, we're still looking at like, what are three things yep. that we can still look for? And then your brain, the more you do it, and I, I can say firsthand that this has been my experience, the more you train your brain to do it, it yep. naturally, well, even in that moment, yep. I can think even this morning, um, somebody, my husband and I were driving and someone went right through a stop sign, super, super fast. Yes. And I was like, wow, like, did I miss something? And then my husband reminded me in that moment, he's like, if we were here three minutes earlier, or I sorry, not even three minutes, 30 seconds earlier, that would have been us. Like we would have, wow. it didn't even occur to me. Right. But it's almost like in that moment, it's like, you're constantly looking for gratitude yep. Yep. and it puts things into perspective, right? Because it's in that moment, it can feel like, oh my God, it's always going to be like this. But then you start to see these silver linings. Well, it, I mean, I, and I, in, in my workshops, I, I'd say it's, it's like when you get a, a new car, could be new car, or new car to you. And then you're driving around town and all of a sudden they're like, wow, they all have them. Everyone has a mini. I have a mini. Do they think like, wow, I got to be cool like Steve and go buy a mini now? It's like, no, that's not what happened. It's you have a heightened sense of awareness, which is exactly what you're talking about. And so as you start to really think about that, you know, gratitude journals, what went well journals, whatever they look like, you know, neuroscientists kind of know what's going on. And as you start to write down those bright spots, you're right. You, you completely, I think the, um, the research I saw was depending on where your starting point is, if you do this daily or, or you know, in the evening, um, five things, it can shift your head over the course of two or three months. Is that, it's just how long it takes. It's not very long at all. Absolutely. And I'm sure, and I'm curious, but I, I like your perspective on this too, but you've experienced this with some of the leaders that you work with, because I know you do some one-on-one -on -one coaching as well, yeah. is that I have to get my, a lot of my leaders doing an assignment where I ask them at the end of the day to, to actually celebrate the wins, like acknowledge every yep. day the wins. Yep. If I didn't do that, they, they're always looking out here and always around what didn't go well in the gaps. And they're not acknowledging and taking a second to pause and celebrate yep. those wins. And yep, I've yep. experienced this during COVID too, right? Like all of these leaders not taking a second to really acknowledge, like, look at all of the things that you've done and the resiliency, the adapting, yeah. the pivoting. I don't know how many times I've heard that word. Like it's I a know. lot, it's a lot like no, acknowledge and celebrate. Well, I, you know, I mean, we were all forced to change and, and going, you know, talking about resiliency and, and um, for some people, you know, just surviving was totally fine. I mean, totally fine for others, you know, once you kind of got your Stella groove in and you're like, oh, okay, this isn't going away. So what do I do? And, and you're absolutely right. And, I, and my, my strategy for, for my leaders is um, I make them create a Friday, 3 p.m., whatever time they are, calendar invite for themselves. And so every Friday, I said, that's your sacred time. You know, like obviously be flexible, but make that your time. And that's the time when you have to identify 
just write down in, in your whatever notebook or, or Excel spreadsheet or whatever works for you, the, the things that happened this week and acknowledge it. And now I will honestly say physician heal thyself because I have not been good about doing that as well. And I have to you know, take my own medicine and I'm totally okay with that because it has been a weird year. And, and um, you know, one of the things that I've done personally to try to capture that, even though some days it was a little harder. So I, I love to write. I mean, you know, the book, this is my third book, technically. Um, I do a lot of journal writing of white papers and articles and all this stuff. So I decided um, that I was going to kind of capture my COVID experience, uh, mostly the good, of course, um, in an article that's loosely titled The Year I Didn't Wear Pants because I haven't wore pants since March 13th. Um, so, you know, as of this recording, it, the anniversary will literally be tomorrow. That is the last time I put on pants. Now, of course I wear shorts, I live in Florida. Um, but um, yeah, I'm like, that's the last time I wore pants. So what happened in the year that I didn't wear pants? And that's when I've been reflecting on the positives and what I've done and, and what's happened uh, from my perspective in the COVID world. Yes. And always bringing in that humor. That's, I love your humor. <laughs> you always bring that in. Um, and you, you brought me somewhere that I was going to bring you right now anyways, which I think is great when you told on yourself a little bit as well, which again, I tell myself to my clients all the time. I'm like, I, sometimes I'll even give them some homework and assignment and say, oh, just so you know, that's also going to be my homework and assignment. <laughs> like you're my teacher. We're teaching one another. Absolutely. And so um, thinking of other leaders who are listening in and I'm all about vulnerability as well. And so what are what have been maybe some things that you've learned about yourself as a leader and opportunities for your growth and where you want to continuously develop? As my, my husband of 23 years has identified, he's like, you work way too much. I said, but I really like work. I mean, I'm blessed. I, some people don't have that. And, and so um, I, I've learned that for me, I always have to do something in order to feel in control. And, and whether that be, um, you know, I, I, I was going to do my own podcast. I decided not to. I, I, I did hire a marketing coach at one point. And she's like, well, just be a professional guest. I'm like, I love that. I'm going to do that. So I've been throwing myself into doing that. Um, you know, I actually recorded my audiobook at the beginning of COVID. That was always on the, the schedule. But in the really early parts of COVID, I, I thank goodness I had that little project lined up because it really kept my mind working and focusing elsewhere than, you know, I mean, uh, to be very vulnerable and truthful, I lost my entire business in uh, by April 2nd. Um, so the way my business works is, uh, per, even though my doctorate's in distance learning, um, we pretty much just focus on face-to-face uh, -face is, is kind of what, what me and my, my clients do. And, and so we have a handful of really big clients and um, we sit, we're, we're done selling basically by February of each year. We're booked for the year um, when it comes to those things. And of course, all three, uh, four actually, uh, came back and said, yeah, you're not coming. You and your team are not setting foot at, at our site. And so all of that went away. And so I was like freaking out, of course, like so many of us listening. And, and so focusing my energy elsewhere in addition to, okay, great. Now I'm, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going in the closet to, to reading this chapter, to record it, to send it to the audio engineer and all that good stuff, which is side note, ironic that I wrote my, or I recorded my queer leadership book in the closet. There's that. Um, but then, <laughs> but then going on and saying, okay, so, so what do I do now? Or, or how do I focus my energy now? And so it, it's been um, the one thing that's really jumped out at me from a learning perspective. And it's one of those, I knew it, but is the concept of servant leadership. And I, I just threw it out there to, to say, hey, I know resiliency. Let me create this course. And, and you know, for a while I was giving it away for free. I mean, it's, it's, I think I forget what we charge for, but it's nothing. Um, hey, let me do a free webinar for you, XYZ organization, just to like give your people something to focus on. And that, those actions have come back like 20 fold now. Um, and people are like, yeah, I remember you did that webinar. Can you do another one? But we'll pay you this time. I'm like, sure, absolutely. And, and so that kind of mentality has really uh, been a, a really good eye opener that when we throw out good stuff, even if we think like, oh, you know, I, I really wish I was getting paid for this, you will some way, shape or form. Yeah, you know what? I that resonates with me on so many levels. I, I remember that's the same exact same place that I went to when it started. I'm just like, I need to serve, I need to give, I need to contribute. And I, I would just reach out, like, tell me who, who are your leaders? Yeah. Who's struggling right now? Who needs support? I'm I'm there for you. Yeah. Um, no attachment to outcome, right? It was just coming from a place of service. And exactly like you said, so so many of those people ended up later on becoming clients and organizations I'm working with. That wasn't the intention. It was just heartfelt coming from a place of 
of service and contribution. And then it makes you feel connected to something so much bigger than yourself, right? Because yep. we're all we're all connected in that way. Totally agree. Yeah. Love it. Um, I said this to you before we got online that I wasn't going to want to stop this conversation because I feel like we can keep talking about so many things. Um, but as we start to wrap up today's conversation, I always like to give my guests an opportunity to, to leave the audience with a final thought, whatever's showing up for you in this moment that you'd like to leave with them. I, I, I think the one thing that's been playing in my head recently is, is the concept of, of knowing that there is a it's an end in sight, but we're not going to go back to what was. And, and I'm totally okay with that, quite frankly. Um, whether it be a new ways of working, you know, from a blended perspective, new ways of corporate learning, um, you know, having more empathy, appreciating a hug more than we used to. The, the end is, is coming, but learn from what happened and, and don't just try to revert back to, you know, February 2020 um, kind of mentality. I, I think uh, you know, glass half full, we've been giving a, an insane gift of understanding and thinking and appreciating and pausing, um, you know, some at a greater cost than others, and I will totally acknowledge that. But for those, you know, just appreciate what happened, learn from it and apply it to kind of what's next. Yeah, I, I, it's a reset, right? So what are you going to do with the reset? Uh, yeah, such good, such good advice. Um, see, where can people find more about you? I'm going to have things in the show notes, but we'll let the audience know. Yeah, so I mean, the easiest one-stop shop for us is topdoglearning.biz, B-I-Z. Um, there you can find stuff about me, my team, um, all the online courses that we offer. Uh, you can see stuff about my book, Pride Leadership, and some of the other books out there. There's some free stuff. Um, that's also available there. Um, lots of lots of um, articles and uh, podcasts uh, guesting at, that I put them out there too. So, uh, and then there's a way to, to say hi to us and, and see if there's any way we can help you. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here today, Steve. Thank you. This was awesome. And, and thank you for all the, the inspirational work that you do. It's voices like that that need to, you know, we all sing from the same songbook, but the louder, the more there are, the louder we are. So thank you for the work you do as well. Beautiful. I am fully receiving that and want to remind everybody who's listening on today. Um, leadership is a journey. It's every day we're learning and growing. So make sure you have a lot of self-compassion and grace with yourself. Bye everyone. <laughs>